Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Columbia Astronomy Public Outreach's public live stream talk and planetarium tour. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Jana Gerswich. I'm the outreach coordinator at Columbia Astrophysics Laboratory. Tonight, we're going to start with a talk, which will last about 30 minutes. And then we'll have some time for questions submitted by chat. So as our speaker is speaking, be thinking about what you'd like to ask him. We'll be responding to those um, after the talk. Um, and finally, we'll board our virtual spaceship and fly around in space using some planetarium software. I have with me today Micah Achinapura, who works on planetarium visualization at the American Museum of Natural History. He's going to be acting as our spaceship pilot for the planetary, planetarium tour portion of the talk. And I also have with me our speaker, Daniel Wolf Savin. Dr. Savin performs laboratory studies of key chemical reactions that drive the physical and chemical evolution of the cosmos. He majored in physics at Columbia University, earned his PhD in physics from Harvard, and did a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley. Then he returned to Columbia, where he's now a senior research scientist in the Columbia Astrophysics Lab. So thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us today. And please give us just a moment as we switch over to Daniel's slides. So I share my screen. Uh, great. Let me know when I shall start. OK, I'd like to thank Jana for the invitation to speak to all of you folks today. I'd like to thank Micah for the technical support and for the planetarium show that we're going to have after the presentation. I'm going to be talking about the Genesis project, and I, I hope I don't disappoint. This is not a Star Trek movie. This is actually a scientific research project. Uh, I'll be talking about the chemistry that led to the formation of the first stars. And what you see here is a picture of me studying the music of the spheres. This work has been carried out at Columbia University, and we have support from the National Science Foundation. Okay, so here is an outline of my presentation. I'll start by talking about the Yomer Elohim, Yehi Or, the Yehi Or. And just in case your biblical Hebrew is a little bit rusty, that translates to as let there be light. So this is the portion of the presentation where I talk about the cosmological motivation behind the work. Supposedly, this happened on Yom Echad, which is Hebrew for day one. So naturally, we call this the uh, D1 experiment. And I will describe to you how we simulate the chemistry that led to the formation of the first stars. Um, okay, so let me move on. One of the reasons that I, um, I like to start with, in case you didn't guess, this is the uh, first few lines of um, Genesis chapter one. I like to start with that because I just want to drive home that humanity has been uh, pondering these kinds of questions for millennia. And it's really humbling to think of ourselves as one in a long line of thinkers and scholars going back to before the era of science as we try to figure out our place in the cosmos. So if I don't understand something, I usually turn to a cartoon book, sorry, a graphic novel. <laughs> um, so what we have here is a cartoon history of the cosmos. And we start with the Big Bang is shown by this white line here at the top. The universe when it formed was extremely dense and extremely hot. As it expanded, it started to cool down and the density decreased. And eventually the light from the Big Bang was able to stream freely through space. And that happened about 400 million years after the Big Bang. That's when the universe became transparent to light. And here is a picture of the universe when it was only 377,000 years old. This is called the cosmic microwave background because the light from that time has been redshifted into the microwave regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
So 377,000 years sounds like it's a really long time, but if we were to think of this as the life of a person, this is basically the picture of what someone would look like at one day after their birth. So this here is a map of the sky in the cosmic microwave background. And the little red portions here are slightly denser than the, the dark blue portions. And so what happens is these red portions are really the seeds for the formation of the galaxies and stars that we see around us today. The higher density in these red regions attracted more matter to them because they had a stronger gravitational attraction. And eventually a runaway effect happens where one begins to build up star galaxies and then stars. So let's go back to the cartoon history of the cosmos. What we have here now is about 15 million years after the Big Bang is when chemistry became important in the evolution of the cosmos. And that's one of my areas of research. And I'm going to talk about the formation of the first stars. The first stars formed about 500 million years after the Big Bang. In a terms of a human lifetime, that corresponds to about four years after birth. These stars were very massive. They had short lives and most of them burned up and uh, used up all their material within a billion years after the Big Bang. So that's called the Giga year. Those stars out of their ashes came future generations of stars. And eventually our sun formed out of clouds that these stars created when they blew up. And then we get to today. So I didn't warn you guys at the very beginning, but there's a chat function on the right hand side. And I like to make this as interactive as possible. So my question to you folks out there is, how old is the cosmos today? May 1st, 2020. You can round it up to the nearest billion years if you prefer. So, all right, I'm gonna wait while people type in some answers. There's about a four second delay between when I say something and when I um, see you typing in. So please feel free to guess. There are no, um, well, I was gonna say there are no wrong answers. No, I'm. <laughs> Um, there are wrong answers, but feel free to be wrong. So, okay, stunned silence. All right. The answer is that it's 13.8 giga years old. And the sun formed about a little over, about 5 billion years ago or 5 giga years ago. So, this is my cartoon history of the cosmos. And let's move on now to talking about the uh, cosmological motivation behind the work. So stars are born in clouds of gas and these clouds of gas are full of elements. And the stars condense out of the clouds, sort of like um, drops of mist, uh, in a cloud. Yep, someone put in 14 billion years. Yep, that's pretty close. So clouds, the, cool, the rate at which these clouds cool is affected by the chemistry in the cloud. And in the modern universe, we have an entire periodic table of elements. Not all of the elements are equally important in controlling the chemistry of the cloud and the rate at which the cloud cooled, but there are a lot of elements to take into account. Fortunately, the universe is a much simpler place and the Big Bang only synthesized three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And to be honest, helium is an inert gas and doesn't react chemically. And the abundance of lithium in the early universe is insignificant. So we can basically ignore them. And for the purposes of my presentation, 
this is the periodic table that I will work with. It has one element in it, and I think I can handle that level of sophistication. Okay, now let's talk about the formation of stars in the early universe. These primordial clouds consisted of about 90% hydrogen, 10% helium, and insignificant amounts of lithium. The clouds were held together by gravity, and what gravity did was it caused the clouds to start to collapse. Now, as the cloud collapsed, the volume went down, the volume decreased, and the temperature increased. So if the clouds had no way to get rid of this excess heat, they would not be able to gravitationally collapse and form stars. And if you're wondering, why does the temperature increase when the volume decreases, I will suggest that you pull out your bicycle pump and pump up your bicycle tire. And what happens is as you compress the air in the bicycle pump, you'll feel the tube in the bike pump getting hotter. And that's because you're working on the gas and so you're heating the gas up. And here gravity is working on the gas, heating the gas up. So the way the clouds cooled is that there's a small fraction of molecular hydrogen in the cloud, 0.01%. And this molecular hydrogen radiated the heat of the cloud away, enabling the cloud to cool and gravitation to cause the cloud to collapse. And you can kind of think about this heat as if you have a hot summer day, you look at the street and you see shimmers of heat radiating away from the street. That's what the hydrogen was doing for the cloud. It was radiating that heat away. And it can cool the gas to a temperature of 200 Kelvin. That's 200 degrees above absolute zero. If you prefer Fahrenheit, that's minus 100 Fahrenheit. So that's really cold. And at temperatures that low, the cloud can begin to gravitationally collapse. And you get gravitational runaway leading to the formation of a star. So what I'm going to show you now is a movie of the a simulation of the formation of the first star. I'll start out by saying that this movie has no sound. So I'd like to ask all of you out there to type in the chat window, why do you think this movie has no sound? And while I'm waiting for your answer to the question of why you think this movie has no sound, I'll say that this is a simulation that my colleague in the astronomy department, Professor Greg Bryan, and his colleagues performed back in 2009. It's a computational simulation that takes into account general relativity, so gravity, takes into account hydrodynamics, this is a gas, which we can think of as a fluid, and it also takes into account the chemistry that I talk about. And I'm having a cough drop just so that I can speak more easily. So <clears throat> I'm still waiting for an answer to the question as to why this movie has no sound. I'm going to run the movie. And what we see here is <coughs> the uh, color contours show a factor of 10 increase in number density. And what's happening is the gas is being drawn towards the gravitational center of the cloud. And we've got every contour is at 10 times more particles per volume. And you can see the gas is falling into the center of the cloud. That's right, there's no sound because space has, space is a vacuum and you can't have a vacuum in sound. Sorry, you can't have sound in a vacuum. Okay, at this point you can see the center part of the cloud and we're gonna dive into the cloud and we're gonna go into the fully molecular portion of the cloud. Here, every, every color contour corresponds to a factor of 10 increase in the molecular hydrogen number density, and I will describe what molecular hydrogen is shortly. Eventually, we're going to see the star in the center of the cloud. Now, this computer simulation is over 10 years old, so the graphical resolution wasn't as high as we can get today, so it doesn't quite look like a star. Now, eventually, we're going to start moving away from the star. We're going to start running away from the star. So my question to you guys is, why are we running away from the star? 
And you got to try to answer quickly because we don't have very much time before the star does what it does at the end of its life, which namely is it blows up. Okay, that's why we were running away from the star. This star during the course of its lifetime has synthesized elements heavier than helium. Those elements get spewed out into space when the star explodes and out of the ashes from the star form future generations of stars. Okay, so let me talk about how molecular hydrogen, which we symbolize by H with the subscript two, how it cools the gas down to temperatures of 200 Kelvin. This is a cartoon simulation. We have a hydrogen molecule here. You can see these two red dots stuck together. That simulates a hydrogen molecule. This is a hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom is moving fast. And what's ha it's hot, so it's moving fast. And the hydrogen atom is gonna collide with the hydrogen molecule. Oh, it missed. Eventually, it will collide with the hydrogen molecule and it will give up some of its energy. It slows down, it cools down. The molecule takes that energy and then radiates it out of the cloud. This is the catalytic process by which molecular hydrogen cooled the primordial clouds so the first stars could form. The reason it's a catalytic process is because the molecular hydrogen is not destroyed in the process. Okay. Let's talk now about the chemistry leading to the formation of the first stars. So I have to tell you what a hydrogen atom is. Hydrogen atom consists of a proton in the nucleus with a positive charge, and there's an electron orbiting the nucleus with a negative charge. This is symbolized by the letter H for hydrogen. This hydrogen atom associates with another hydrogen atom. Actually, that reminds me of a really bad joke. So you guys have a choice. You can either get really great science and really bad jokes, or actually, I'm sorry, you don't get a choice. You get really great science and really bad jokes. Two hydrogen atoms are walking down the street and they bump into one another. And the first one says, oh my God, I think I lost an electron. And the second one says, are you certain? And the first one says, yes, I'm positive. Okay, for all of those folks out there with a the drum set, you might wanna get it ready for the next joke. Okay, so these two hydrogen atoms, actually the second hydrogen atom is a little bit different. It has an extra electron. So the total charge of the second hydrogen atom is minus one. You have the plus one in the center and two negative electrons. We symbolize that as H minus. The H and H minus associate to make molecular hydrogen where they're sharing the two electrons and the extra electron detaches. So this process is called associative detachment. I should say that many of my friends are therapists and they tell me that if someone walked into their office with this condition, they would probably prescribe some of the primordial lithium. But no, this is not a psychological condition. This is a fundamental chemical process that led to the formation of the first stars. Okay, I also wanna emphasize that this is chemistry. It's not nuclear fusion. The nuclei do not fuse together to form a single nucleus. They remain distinctive nuclei. Okay. So let me show you a little bit of data. I'm doing this to give you a sense of what we look at uh, before we do an experiment. This is how fast the reaction goes forward. And this is the gas temperature here. So this is 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. And all of these black circles with the vertical lines those are theoretical, sorry, those are experimental measurements. And everything else on this plot is a theoretical calculation. So it looks like these theoretical calculations and these measurements are in really good agreement. So that must be the right answer, right? Well, the truth of the matter is no. These are the newest theoretical calculations. 
So when we started this project in 19, sorry, in 2005, it was 80 years since quantum mechanics had been discovered in 1925. And theory and experiment had still not converged to the same answer for one of the simplest chemical processes in the cosmos. So let me talk about the experiment that we built in order to be able to study this. This is how we mimic the chemistry that led to the formation of the first stars. We go to a video arcade and we play Pac-Man. All right. Um, we take a gas discharge, which is basically we send electrical current through a gas, like a neon sign. Here you can see the gas discharge is outlining the Pac-Man figure. We extract a beam of H minus atoms, ions actually. And then we take that beam and we shoot a really high power laser across the ion beam. And yes, this is a picture of Ghostbusters, but no, we did not get our laser from them. And what happens is that the laser rips off the extra electron about 10% of the time, creating neutral hydrogen atoms. And now we have H minus and H interacting, co-propagating. That's right, don't cross the streams. Um, so we detect the H2 that's formed. That's the chemistry that we study. Let me show you a picture of the apparatus the day after we got first signal. You can tell it's the day after we got first signal because these smiley balloons here, here and here, we're celebrating. Now this is a power control rack with a bunch of high voltage units in it. And behind that, we have our gas discharge to make H minus. We extract the beam into a vacuum because even though you can move your hand through air, if you try to send an ion beam through air, it's like hitting a wall. The ions will not travel very far. So, um, so we have our H minus beam going through vacuum. We have our laser here. We cross the laser. Yeah, we do cross the beams, the laser beam and the ion beam. Fortunately, nothing bad happens. We threw photo detachment, remove the extra electron about 10% of the time and we make a neutral hydrogen beam. These continue on to chemically react forming H2. And then at the end of the, um, at the, end of the experiment, we send the H2 into a, ga a gas cell where we ionize the H2. See, H2 is neutral and we can't use electrical voltages or magnetic fields to separate the H2 from the parent hydrogen beam. So we have to ionize it and then we can electrostatically deflect it onto a detector. So that's, that's what the apparatus looks like. And now I have a question for you folks. How much do you think this cost? So I have three answers and it's a multiple choice. So the answers are either A, B, or C. So when you see the answer that you think is the right answer, type in either A, B, or C. How many people think, A, that this costs $10,000? How many people think, B, that this costs $100,000? And how many people think, C, this costs a million dollars? So again, type into the chat, A, $10,000, B, $100,000, C, a million dollars. Okay, I see one C so far. Do we have any other votes? I see an uppercase C. I see one B. I see another B, a C. Let me, a couple more votes, please. An A, a B. All right, so the actual answer to this, how much did it cost? Another B, $735,548. And so people who said C were basically right. Um, so that money was from the National Science Foundation and half of it went into purchasing the equipment. A quarter of it went to pay the salary of my group members and you'll meet my group members in a moment. And the other quarter went into paying for the electricity and the administrative staff and the facilities who provided the support and the building maintenance where the laboratory is located. 
So this is us celebrating our success. You can see we have smiley balloons. I wanna emphasize laboratory safety is very important. We are wearing eye protection. And I should also say that this is not an alcoholic beverage. So I wanna point out Holger Kreckel from Germany, Yama Bruns from Germany, and Ken Miller from the United States are my three postdocs who worked on the project and brought it to success. And Xavier Urban, my colleague from Belgium, who was a key member of the project at multiple phases. Uh, I would encourage all of you folks to collaborate with people from Belgium because they, they tend to bring cho chocolate with them when they come visit. Okay. So I showed this plot earlier of the previously published theoretical and experimental results. This again is how fast the reaction goes forward as a function of temperature. And you can see the black line shows our experimental result. And we can never measure anything perfectly. So the dashed curve above and below is the uncertainty. And what that means is that the newest theoretical calculations and the newest experimental results have finally converged to the same answer. Molecular hydrogen forms faster than was thought. And that means that the first stars form faster. So we got a lot of press coverage about this. This is a, the homepage at the National Science Foundation. This is a picture of the apparatus and our results were published in science. We were quite excited to get in such a high profile journal. Uh, I should also say, as I start to wrap up that the science also inspired art by a colleague of mine. She was wondering, how, how to make the uh, abstract idea of star formation sensory somehow. And she wanted to do it through sound. So she created a space to embody the uh, birth of the first star. And this yurt-like structure is what she built. And it's a sound sculpture. So it has speakers inside. It's made of wood, felt, and hog intestine. And I'm a little bit confused about the last part because my friend is a um, vegetarian, but one of her favorite media to work with is hog intestine. So Barbara Yance is the artist and she also did the sound. You can see here in this picture between myself and Garth Whitcomb who worked with her on the sound. If anyone's interested in finding out more, starwomb.com, again, starwomb.com is the website for that. So just to, conclude the presentation. And I have to say that it's been really wonderful to be able to share this with everyone here today. One of the things I wanna drive home is that astronomy involves more than just looking through a telescope. There are laboratory researchers such as myself who try to reproduce the cosmos through experiments in laboratories here on earth. And what we in my group have done is we've reproduced the chemistry leading to the formation of the first stars. And that basically brings me to the end of my presentation. So I just want to stop there. Thank you for your attention and take any and all questions that you folks may have for us. So Micah and Jana, take it away, please. Hello, yes. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Daniel, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, to our audience, please be thinking of questions. Just type them into the uh, chat and we'll be answering them. Um, and okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I Done. had a question about um, the star womb to start out with, because <laughs> yes. I had not seen that before. What does it sound like in there? It's really interesting. My um, colleague was trying to ask me what is the sound that is associated with the cosmos and one of well the cosmos is a vacuum so there really isn't a sound but there is a light that is associated with the cosmos and that would be the light that atomic hydrogen gives off and the fundamental wavelength of Lyman of hydrogen atoms if you convert that into sound corresponds to C sharp mm. So it was a piece that was 
based around C sharp. And for all of those out there who play musical instruments and read music, you'll all realize that C sharp is a really unpleasant key to have to play. <laughs> nice. So, um, so I'm kind of curious. I uh, one of your points was that um, astronomers are also working in laboratories and learning about the universe by doing experiments here on Earth. And I was wondering how you got interested in doing laboratory experiments as opposed to, you know, what might be considered more traditional um, astronomy with telescopes and things like that. So I've always been interested in astronomy, and I've always been interested in physics. And I ended up doing graduate work in physics. But when I was looking for a um, research project for my PhD, I stumbled upon a researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics who combines both atomic physics work and in his particular case, solar physics studies. Mm -hmm. And I really liked the fact that I'm trying to help answer cutting edge questions in astronomy and astrophysics by simulating what happens in the cosmos through laboratory measurements and taking our results and going back to answer the astrophysics question. I really like that complete circle. Mm -hmm. And what do you find is the most challenging part of making this laboratory, uh, you know, it looks like this elaborate <laughs> apparatus, right? And I'm sure it, it takes a lot of calibration and, and um, care and work to get that working properly. Um, what, what challenges did you have to um, overcome in order to, to get the results? So I should say that my role in the project is to really think of the scientific questions and then get the uh, grant support for the project. And it's really my postdocs who are the talent that are able to realize the vision. And so the challenge is finding the talented postdocs who are capable of creating something out of nothing. And I've been very fortunate in having really world-class scientists come to work with me for a couple of years and do these projects. Okay, I think Great. So it looks like we have a question from Hubbard 45. So um, they'd like you to summarize the significance of the talk to, to the cosmos in one or two sentences. So they want you to distill it down for them. <laughs> oh, well, about distilling, we'll get to that later, right? <laughs> um, the based on the chemistry, the first stars formed faster than people expected. And so that means the first galaxies formed earlier than expected. And that means the elements and the molecules that formed in the early universe formed earlier than expected. So if you will, you could say that the cosmic pathway towards life initiated earlier than we realized. And so what, so if we find that as you have with your experiments that molecular hydrogen is forming earlier, um, how might we confirm that with observations? What do we look for or other astronomers? This is, this is a really difficult problem because we wanna to try to see the first stars. And the first stars are, they lived 13 billion years ago. That means that we have to be able to look 13 billion light years away. And the first stars were not bright enough to be able to shine that far. So we're looking for somehow identifying uh, their interactions on the atomic hydrogen and the intergalactic gas. Um, we, we will see if we're able to see the effects of those first stars on these hydrogen atoms in the intergalactic gas. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I, ha I, have, I have a question I'm just curious about. So uh, some, some viewers might think that behind you, it's the moon. What is your, what is your background <laughs> <laughs> there so, and why, <laughs> why have you chosen it? I feel like this is, this is the question, right? Why does anybody choose their Zoom background these so, days? <laughs> Thanks, thanks for the question. So this is the planet Mercury behind me. 
And I've chosen it for the background because one of my research projects involves trying to study the formation of the planet Mercury. It's a really interesting question. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all rocky planets, and they all have iron cores. Earth, Venus, and Mars, the 50% of the diameter of the planet is made out of iron. Mercury, it's 80% of the diameter. So Mercury has a lot of iron in it, but when we look on the surface, there's very little iron. So what we're trying to understand is how did the planet Mercury form that makes it different from the other rocky planets? And this has potential implications for also our understanding of exoplanet formation around other stars. So I chose this background because of that project. Mm -hmm. And we had a question from the audience. Uh, what happened to your equipment after the results were published? Very interesting question. So what I tried to do after the project was finished was move into a different area of chemistry. And it's extremely challenging and very competitive. And even though we got good reviews, the reviews for the proposals that we wrote were not good enough. And so we were not able to get any funding for that project to continue. And in the meanwhile, I had a high school student come to me and say, hey, Dr. Savin, I'm interested in what happens when um, protons from the solar wind interact with ices on comets and uh, form organic molecules. Uh, can I work with you? And I was like, dang, I wasn't that smart at 15. <laughs> so, so I invited him to start doing a summer reading course with me where we looked at the interaction of protons with airless bodies like, like Mercury or the moon. And I started writing grant applications to study, to simulate the interaction of the solar wind with these airless bodies. And I started collaborating with colleagues who were experts in asteroids, experts on Mercury. And eventually, it only took us five years of writing grant applications. We managed to get funded to build an apparatus to simulate the solar wind ions irradiating the surface of Mercury. So the apparatus that I used to form, to study the chemistry leading to the formation of the first stars has now become an apparatus to study the interaction of solar wind protons with rocky surfaces. And you can think of this project as arising out of the ashes of the D1 project. So we naturally call this the Phoenix project. Nice. <laughs> All right, so I think with that, um, if we have no last minute questions, um, we'll move on to our planetarium tour portion. So um, uh, Micah is going to be our spaceship captain. He's going to be flying us around. So this is a uh, live flying that he's doing. Micah, do you want to tell us a little bit about the software that we're using and what we're actually observing here? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Micah. And what we're seeing here is uh, the software called OpenSpace, which is a free open source software that I'm working on at the Museum of Natural History. And it's our goal is to bring in as much data as we can and to be able to visualize it together so that you can see different types of data uh, in context with each other. So, uh, for example, right here, what we're looking at is uh, our Milky Way galaxy. And then we have a couple of data sets turned on. We have this little dot here that shows where we are in the Milky Way galaxy. This blue sphere is represents uh, where we live in the galaxy. And, it, and when we get closer, we'll see it represents uh, how much of our galaxy has heard from us. So you're talking about that small blue sphere that's kind of on the lower right part yeah. of the screen? Mm -hmm. and that's so just, that's the location of Earth in, in the galaxy, the Milky Way. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, that's the location of Earth. And, and when we get closer, you'll see it's flanked by another data set we've turned on, uh, which is a star data set. So, and, you know, here we're looking at our Milky Way, which, you know, we don't actually have real pictures of our Milky Way. So this is a constrained simulation uh, to simulate a galaxy like ours. 
And so, if you look carefully, you'll start to see these kind of like, it's almost like rays coming out of the location of Earth. Yeah. I'm seeing. And so that's, I've turned on these, um, the law and apogee data sets, which are combining mm -hmm. a bunch of surveys to give us, um, to tell us about the chemical elements inside of stars. Yeah, so, so here, those... so all of those are locations of actual stars, positions of stars um, in our galaxy that have measurements of the chemistry of those stars. So those lines are the lines of sight we're looking along a line of sight. That's exactly it looks like correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the stars mostly made of hydrogen and helium, but they also have um, many trace elements. And those trace elements are so important for understanding those stars, where they came from, um, how they're evolving, um, and also um, information about how our galaxy came to be, because we think large galaxies, spiral galaxies like our Milky Way were built out of um, out of smaller galaxies and learning about the chemistry of the stars can tell us a little bit of, um, of the origin of those stars, whether they came from a stellar stream um, or things like that. So stars do have color, but actually the color that we're seeing right now, is this the, the iron content? So they're coded, color coded by iron content? Yeah, these? and so the, here it's not the real color, but the color represents the amount of iron. So a blue star would have a lot and a yellow would have a little and then mm -hmm. uh, a green one would have something in between. So let me fly so, us in a denser stream here. So the elements that we're looking at, the iron and such, those were synthesized in the uh, center of stars through nuclear fusion. You can think of stars as factories for forging the elements. And the more massive the star is, the more gravitational energy it has to convert into elements. So it starts out by taking hydrogen and squeezing them together to make helium. Then it can take three helium atoms and squeeze them together to make carbon. And that's how most of the carbon in the cosmos uh, formed. And it keeps building up that way by adding hydrogen atoms afterwards, all the way up to iron. And the uh, first generation of stars had no iron. The second generation of stars had more elements heavier than helium. And in astronomy, anything heavier than helium, we call a metal. So the second generation of stars had more metals, but they also blew up. And out of their ashes, they formed even more metals. And it's out of the ashes of the second generation of stars that stars such as the sun formed, which would be called a third generation star, which is rich in elements. Yeah, that, that actually brings up a question I, I, I posed to myself when I was listening to your talk because I had actually heard maybe that the sun was a fifth generation star. And I was wondering if somehow your results about uh, how early stars had formed maybe had something to do with uh, that calculation or an impact on it. Um, that's a really good question. I have to be honest, I've never heard the expression fifth generation star. So... Okay. Um, I've always heard it talked about as uh, a third generation star, but maybe I just haven't read that article yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I might, I might not be correct as well. So, uh, do you, um, so um, here we're seeing this, uh, this kind of pattern in the sky, um, of squares. <laughs> and yeah. of course it's not that the, it's not that the stars are only in those patches with squares. It's that, um, this is, we've looked at the chemistry of stars that were observed by a certain spacecraft. And this is the, basically the footprint, the pattern that the detector of that spacecraft, Kepler, makes um, if you look at the sky. And so we just happen to detect things where the detector looks. And this is the shape of the detector. Um, it looked projected out into the sky because that's where those stars that we've measured the chemistry of live. Um, of yeah, course, we think it would be the same everywhere, but we haven't looked everywhere yet. <laughs> and Kepler was a mission designed to look at, for exoplanets orbiting other stars. And one of the exciting results was that basically every star is thought to host a planetary system. 
So I always find it awesome because when I was in college and I admit it was back in the last millennium when we still used clay tablets, mm -hmm. uh, if someone had said, oh yeah, we're going to be studying planets around other stars, people would have laughed at them. It's like, yeah, yeah, right. But now exoplanets are one of the leading research areas in astronomy and astrophysics today. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's amazing how they have different ways of detecting the exoplanets. Um, and then they also have ways of now studying maybe if the exoplanets have atmospheres or not. Oh, that's the most fascinating thing. Looking for biosignatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets is, uh, is cutting edge. And yeah. I, I fully expect that within the next decade, especially with the launching of James Webb Space Telescope, hopefully in the next year or so, uh, they will be able to detect atmospheres, planetary atmospheres that have elements like oxygen, which uh, are chemically very reactive and can only exist if there's some process such as life, as we know it, that feeds oxygen into the atmosphere. Oh, so here we've gone closer to home. So you may recognize this, this is our solar system. And so we're zooming into the inner planets um, and so they're not spaced evenly. Those inner planets are much closer to the sun than those outer planets. Um, and let's visit one of those inner planets um, because of course the, there's chemistry in stars, but uh, the sun is a star and the sun formed out of a solar nebula, which also contained uh, many different elements enriched by those prior generations of stars. And that's reflected in our planetary systems as well here on Earth. Of course, we're all made from those elements. Um, and then here we're looking at uh, the closest planet to the sun, Mercury. Yeah. Yep. So as I said earlier, Mercury is a fascinating planet because even though it's a rocky planet, it's different from the other rocky planets. And the surface is not very abundant in iron, whereas Mars is red for a reason, it's, it's rust. So, so here I've actually turned on a map showing the iron abundance on the surface of Mercury. Mm -hmm. And um, as we can see, there's not very much red. Red would be a high concentration, whereas green would be a low concentration. And these so data were collected from the messenger mission that's right. which orbited Mercury for four years and collected a lot of fascinating information. And the next mission to Mercury is going to be Bepi Colombo, which I think is due to arrive in about five or six years. Wow, that's gonna be exciting. Yeah. We, uh, I should also mention that the, the imagery that you're seeing of Mercury was collected by the messenger mission. So along with its, um, you know, it has uh, spectrometers along with cameras, and so we use the we use data from all of their sen remote sensors in order to visualize Mercury. Um, and so, you know, let's go away from Mercury a little bit. We should remind people that there is a chat, so if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask, to please type in a question. Yeah, so let's let's actually zoom out and look at the. We mentioned uh, we talked about atmosphere, so let's take a look at the the three planets, inner planets that have atmospheres here. So if I just press J, we can see uh, Earth and Venus and Mars. Right? <laughs> These are our okay. inner planets that have. Uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting because I was always kind of thought of these as the the planets that have atmospheres, and then someone reminded me that you know. Jupiter's got an atmosphere too. It's just all atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but this is Earth and, and Venus. Uh, they have the type of atmosphere that we're trying to detect around an exoplanet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yep. one major way that we look for these exoplanets is looking for basically little eclipses um, where part of the light is blocked out from the star. So the planet goes around the star. Uh, the planet blocks some of the light from the star. We call that a transit. And that's how we can tell that there's a planet there. Um, but we also might hope that some small part of that light is going through the atmosphere. So if you could kind of like 
line up the sun behind the earth here and you imagine you're some distant um, alien uh, astronomer looking for, um, for, for signals in the light. You know what the star's light look li looked like and then you look for the pattern that comes from the atmosphere of the planet itself. Um, and so that's one way we can kind of look for the constituents of the atmosphere um, in the uh, spectrum of light and learn something um, about the potential or existence of life um, on other worlds that are so far away, we can't obviously directly detect that life. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll take us to Earth and we can, we can see how thin the Earth's atmosphere is. And it's pretty amazing that we could detect something so thin on a planet so far away. So the atmospheres of the uh... Rocky planets are interesting. Venus has no water. And part of the reason it has no water is because it's so hot that the water that it did have evaporated into the atmosphere. And then the ultraviolet light from the sun's, uh, from the sun photo dissociated that. And the hydrogen, which is very light, just left the atmosphere. And that's the process by which the water was lost from Venus. Mars has uh, no atmosphere to or a very weak atmosphere because it doesn't have a magnetic field to protect the atmosphere against the solar wind. And so the atmosphere of Mars has been scraped away by the solar wind blowing past it. Earth has an atmosphere. We are protected by the magnetic field on Earth from the solar wind. And that's why we still have an atmosphere. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, how between Venus, Mars, and Earth, we've, we've got it just right, you know? <laughs> or, I mean, it's always like, you know, it's like a water in a hole, right? Which is like, the water says, why do I fit it so perfectly in this <laughs> hole, right? It's such a coincidence, right? But of course, it's, it's the water that forms to the hole and not the other way around. That's how we are with well, the Earth. <laughs> it's, it's only going to be good here on Earth for about another... 500 million years because what's going to happen is as the sun gets older it gets a little bit hotter and what that does is it's going to accelerate chemistry between silicon in the rocks and carbon dioxide in the earth's atmosphere that's going to suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and when carbon dioxide is gone plants die when plants die animals are not that far behind so unless we can move the orbit of the earth further away from the sun, we have about 500 million years before the earth is no longer habitable to life as we know it. I hope by that time that we have something figured out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're yeah. living somewhere else or we've got some. Yeah. So yeah, somebody the... uh, pointed out that they're seeing the Pleiades. So there's a little open cluster called the yeah. Pleiades and you see it, it's like right in the middle, just over the atmosphere, between the atmosphere and of Earth and the sun. That kind of that worked out That little, little cluster of stars, that concentration of stars. Um, and so, of course, if you, um, a product placement, the Subaru is the Japanese word for the, uh, uh, the Pleiades. And so their wow. logo on cars is, is supposed to be that little asterism there, that little group of stars. So, That's so I see we've got a question there. Is it possible? This is from Kelly O'Donnell. Is it possible as the sun dies that life could generate on Mercury or Venus briefly? So mm -hmm. what's going to happen as the sun ages, it's actually going to get bigger and it's going to expand at least to the orbit of Earth. And so Mercury and Venus are going to be incinerated, unfortunately. Earth quite possibly will be also. Um, so maybe Mars, but Mars doesn't have enough gravity or magnetic field to hold an atmosphere. So uh, I, I will say that's not going to happen for about 4 billion years. So we don't have to worry about the sun doing us in by blowing up or anything, or by turning into a red giant. I mean, we have to worry about the sun doing us in just because it gets hotter. That, that's long enough to, for us to reach other stars even. Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Do we have any, uh, any last comments here, questions? Oh, uh, well, while we're waiting for any last questions, 
Uh, Micah, could you pull up the uh, picture of the uh, Milky yeah. Way again? And because one of the things that I wanted to um, let's see, did you have an image of? Yeah, uh, here we go. That... There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an image of Sagittarius B two. It's a molecular cloud, and we're looking towards the galactic center, and it is. The beginning of the weekend and many of us are looking forward to our uh, quarantini all right so i'd like to close with the discovery in 1975 of ethyl alcohol and for those of you who might remember your high school chemistry this is a kind that does not make you go blind um, so in 1975 they looked towards sag b2 they discovered ethyl alcohol uh, this was published by zuckerman and his colleagues and they write in the first paragraph of um, their paper, which was published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, ethyl alcohol has been of interest to humanity since the dawn of the earliest civilization. <laughs> During early October of 1974, Dr. Zuckerman and his colleagues detected a truly astronomical source of ethyl alcohol located in the general direction of the center of our galaxy. Parenthetically, if you want to know where the party is, that's where it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Preliminary estimates indicate that the alcoholic content of Sagittarius B2, if purged of all impurities and condensed, would approximate, would yield approximately 10 to the 28th. That's a one followed by 28 zeros. 10 to the 28 fifths at 200 proof. It makes, it makes a good hand sanitizer also. <laughs> nice. The concluding sentence is, this exceeds the total amount of all of humanity's fermentation efforts since the beginning of recorded history. <laughs> so I think with that, I wanna wish everyone a happy weekend. Yes, thank Fantastic. you guys so much for joining. Um, just one more thing I'm going to put in the chat. Uh, there's a link to a survey, which helps us out a lot. If you could just fill that out, just so we can get an idea of our audience. Um, we'll be doing regular events. Um, uh, please join our email list. Uh, you can find that at outreach.astro.columbia.edu, and you can sign up for notifications there. And of course, subscribe to this YouTube channel to be updated whenever we go live. So thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend and keep looking up. Thanks everyone.